Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, on this beautiful fall afternoon, we thank you for keeping us indoors for just a little bit. You're allowed to joke when you pray. Nobody got that. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day. Thank you for gathering us together today to uh, reflect upon your revelation to us through salvation history. We ask you to please send your spirit upon us to open up our hearts and our minds to hear you speak to us anew. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're talking a little bit about salvation history today. Who's heard the term salvation history before? Anybody? Awesome. We're going to learn about it today. Salvation history is one of those cool things that uh, you, you ever wonder, like, how can you know that God exists? Yeah, probably most of you in the room, hopefully, right? In addition to the literally mountains of scientific evidence that points towards a creator, and in addition to the piles and piles and heaps and piles of evidence from logic and philosophy that there probably is a supreme being. And in addition to the intimate evidence in your own heart of your desires for something deeper, something more permanent, more lasting, better than just another like or another friend request or another insert your own social media, whatever here. Right, we all have this deep-seated desire for something more, something permanent and lasting, right? In addition to that, in addition to that intimate voice inside that is always nagging you to do good and to avoid evil. All those things point towards God. In addition to all that, we've got the testimony of literally millions of people who claim to have spoken with the Creator, met the Supreme Being, and hung out with that voice inside of them. Literally millions of people claim to have encountered this being. And those stories compiled in the Bible we call salvation history. All right, so you guys have talked a little bit about the Old Testament. What we want to do today is look through just the highlights. What is the basic plot line of salvation history? What is it these millions of people who've encountered this being, what did they learn about it? <laughs> and what does that tell us about who this, this God person just might be? Right? So we're going to kind of dance around a little bit throughout the Bible a little bit here today. You guys have uh, you've covered the creation stories already, right? Yeah? So we're going to skip through that to where the whole story falls apart in Genesis chapter 3. Right? Because God is such a storyteller, he can't just tell one version of creation, he's got to tell it two different ways. So he gives us two different creation stories, and then the whole thing starts to go downhill in the third chapter of this giant book. It's one of my favorite chapters in the whole book. This will probably sound familiar to most of you. It says this, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? And the woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. It's only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said you shall not eat it or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. No, God knows well the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. <laughs> it's a ridiculous picture, right? <laughs> sewed a bunch of leaves together, made some clothes, and then tried to hide from God in a bush. <laughs> right? And then you probably know the rest of the story. God shows up, he asks a bunch of questions, they're not willing to answer those questions, and he just deals out the consequences. We usually focus on the consequences, but we miss the part where God promises to fix it. Right? In the midst of this whole God's beautiful creation falling apart in front of him <laughs> because of us. Right? People are the, we're human beings, we're the only thing in all of creation that can willfully choose to violate our own nature. Do you ever think about that? Trees in the fall don't decide, ah, I'd rather not make leaves this year, they're just going to fall off in the fall, I'd rather not do it. You have to, or you'll die. <laughs> no, I'd rather not do it. Right? Fruit plants don't just decide, I'm not going to flower this year, I'd rather not do it. No, you, you kind of have to or you'll die, that's what you do. We're the only thing in all of creation that can willfully violate our own nature. And on the day that we did that, God comes in and he promises, I'm going to fix it. There are going to be some consequences, but I'm going to fix it. We always miss the I'm going to fix it part. We just focus on the pain and childbirth and the suffering and death and works hard and all that stuff. Right? It's like when I tell my kids after dinner time, I want you guys to clean up the living room and then we're going to have brownies and ice cream. And they're like, oh, Dad, you're going to make us clean up the living room. I'm like, did you guys miss the part about brownies and ice cream? <laughs> right? There's good news in there. God promises he's going to fix it. He's going to send a redeemer to crush the head of that serpent. But it's going to take some time. Right? So at the very beginning, we've got 
the man and the woman who choose to willfully violate their own nature and just add chaos and anarchy into God's beautiful creation. It gets worse from there <laughs> because their kids kill each other. Well, one of them kills the other one. The other one's dead and can't kill his brother because he's dead, right? Cain kills Abel. It gets worse from there. People try to build a tower to heaven because they want to try to be better than God. It gets worse from there. There's this dude called Lamech. You've probably never heard of Lamech. He's the worst scum of the earth guy in the Bible. He kills a child for making fun of him and he brags about it. Right? So the world is, just, yeah, yeah, utter chaos. I know, right? That's nuts. Utter chaos. And so God's like, all right, we got to reboot this thing. <laughs> Let's just flood the world and start all over again. There's one righteous dude left, Noah. So God's like, all right, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Get your wife, your three sons, and their three wives in it. I'm flooding the earth. We're starting over again. How would you like to be one of the wives or the three sons? The Bible says Noah was the only righteous man, and those seven other schleps got saved because of him. <laughs> I know. It's a technical theological term for people in the Bible. <laughs> it's a good day for those folks, right? He's righteous and they get saved. That's not fair. That's how God works. <laughs> One person's righteousness can make up for everybody else's stupidity. So God floods the world and he starts again and they get off the boat and bad stuff starts to happen again. Fast forward a couple centuries to a guy named Abraham. You guys have heard of Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons and you wave all your arms and legs and all that fun stuff. Right? Abraham is 99 years old when God shows up and just wrecks his life. <laughs> For good. God shows up and he tells Abraham this. This is in Genesis chapter 12, if you're curious. The Lord said to Abram, his name was Abram at the time, Abram, go forth to the land, go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to the land that I'll show you. And I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the nations of the earth shall find blessing through you. And Abram went as the Lord directed him. He's 99 years old. God just shows up and is like, pack up, head west, I'll tell you when to stop. If that was a story about me, the next line is going to be, and then Jason said, no, <laughs> I don't want to. Give me a month. I got something I got to wrap up. Maybe I'll do it next year. Abraham's like, cool, I'll do it. I'm 99, whatever. He packs up and he just heads west. That's insane faith. Two chapters later, though, we have a very fun encounter between Abraham and this, this person, God. This is in uh, Genesis 15. It says, Sometime after these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And God says this, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. I will make your reward very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord, what good will your gifts be if I keep on being childless and have as my heir the steward of my house, Eliezer? Like, did you catch that? Abram just like cut God off. God shows up and he's doing his God divine vision thing. And Abram's like, yeah, 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 that's nice, but I don't have any kids. So how am I going to have all these descendants if I don't have any kids? Your promises mean nothing to me. Have you ever prayed like that? <laughs> like, God, you promised you got my back and you got my best interest at heart, but my life is a wreck right now. Where are you? That's Abraham's prayer. Yeah, yeah, God, that's cute stuff and everything, but like, where are you? Where's the real make, making good on these promises? They're nice promises, but I'm not seeing it happen. And God's like, calm down, Abraham. <laughs> Let's go outside for a walk. <laughs> Take a look at the stars. You're going to have more kids than there are stars in the sky. Just wait. And it eventually comes to fruition. But Abraham has this awesome encounter with God who is freakishly patient. Because if I'm God and Abraham's giving me that lip, I'm like, dude, I flooded the world and killed everybody. I'll end you too. <laughs> right? That's not God's response. God's response is, I get it. You're having a bad day. <laughs> Let's go for a walk and talk about this, right? He's patient. He's a good friend. He gets it, even though he's God and we're this pitiful little creature that doesn't quite understand him and has the audacity to backtalk the creator of the universe. The creator of the universe is like, calm down, it's going to be okay. All right? That little passage there with Abraham, by the way, God tips his hand and he shows you the plot line for the rest of the story. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 12, God shows the plot line. He's going to give Abraham land. He's going to make a great name out of him, which means kings will descend from him, and all families of the earth will find blessing through him, universal blessings. Those three things are the next three movements in the entire story, right? Because the next key character is Moses. God's people go down into Egypt because of a famine, and Pharaoh ends up enslaving them due to some bizarre circumstances. You got these, these God's people slaves in Egypt for four or five hundred years before God shows up and wrecks Moses' life for good. You guys know Moses, right? So back in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 3, we have a very interesting encounter with God. We have a very dramatic moment too, right? At the end of chapter 2, it says this. 
A long time passed during which the king of Egypt died. Still the Israelites groaned and cried out because of their slavery. As their cry for release went up to God, he heard their groaning and was mindful of his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, Abraham's son, and Jacob, Abraham's grandson. He saw the Israelites and knew, dot, 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 dot. Literally, the dots are in the Bible. <laughs> it's an incomplete sentence in Hebrew. It's God sees their problem and he knew. Dramatic pause. What happens next? Meanwhile, Moses was tending... <laughs> God's a storyteller, he just can't help himself, <laughs> right? Let's give him the hook and then we'll change the scene. We'll get back to that in a minute, right? So what does God do here in Genesis 3? Moses is out tending his father-in-law's sheep and he sees something bizarre. Anybody know what it was? Yeah? Burning bush. Burning bush, right? Bush catches fire in the desert, not strange, happens all the time. What was strange was the bush didn't burn up. It just kept burning, still has leaves on it. And then it starts talking. That's even weirder, even in the desert. Bushes don't talk, right? So this voice starts coming out of this thing, and Moses is going back and forth with his voice in the bush, right? And the bush voice is telling him, go tell Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the earth, to let millions of people who are his slave labor go free. And Moses is like, this is a fool's errand. I'm not doing this. And the voice is like, yeah, I want you to do it. And, the voice, and Moses is like, I don't speak well. And the voice is like, I don't care. You can go anyway. And Moses is like, I don't want to. And God's like, ah, you're going to do it. And Moses is like, well, what if they ask me your name? What should I tell them? Right? But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you, and, shall be, and this shall be your proof that it is I who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this very mountain. He's on a mountain on the Sinai Peninsula. But, said Moses to God, when I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What am I to tell them? I don't know your name. I can't do this. I think God can handle this. All right, so God replied, I am who I am. Then he added, this is what you shall say to the Israelites. I am sent me to you. All right, so God's, God's response to Moses is equal parts answering his question and smacking him upside the head. <laughs> All right, what's your name? What am I going to tell him your name is? I am who I am. Just go tell him. By the way, my name is I am. Which is the very reason that the Jews wouldn't even utter God's name. Because it's in the first person. God's name isn't he is. God's name is I am, but it, I, I'm not God. <laughs> Right? You can't say God's name without saying you are God, except Jesus Christ did it a bunch of times. And that's why people wanted to kill him. Don't believe anyone who ever tells you Jesus never claimed to be God. He used God's name multiple times. And that's the very reason that the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted to have him killed. They weren't... Too worried about the, the miracle worship, the miracle worker, and the storyteller, and doing stuff on the Sabbath. They were mad about that, but they were really furious about him using God's name of himself, without any kind of clarifications or anything like that. Right. So Moses has this interesting interaction with God. He encounters this divine being in a bush, and what does God reveal to him? He says, "I am." What is my name? My name is Being. God's name is Existence. <laughs> God's name is I exist. <laughs> Anything else that exists participates in some strange way in this being's life. That includes you and me. We all get to participate in being's being. Right? That'll blow your mind for a minute if you think about that long enough. Right? So Moses leads them out of slavery. You know, there's the ten plagues and all that sort of stuff. He leads them out of slavery. They get to the Red Sea. Pharaoh changes his mind, sends an army. Moses prays. They part the Red Sea. They get across the other side. Pharaoh's army goes in. They all drown. Everybody's having a good time now, right? And then they get to Mount Sinai and God shows up again. And one of the coolest moments in the entire course of salvation history. This is in Exodus 19. Hopefully you've heard this before, but I'm going to read it again. Exodus 19. It's called the Great Theophany. And it goes like this. On the morning of the third day, the third day since they got to this mountain, there were peals of thunder and lightning and a heavy cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. But Moses led the people, let the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stationed themselves at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was all wrapped in smoke, for the Lord came down upon it in fire. The smoke rose from it as though from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. The trumpet blast grew louder and louder, while Moses was speaking and God answering him with thunder. 
So you got all these people at the base of Mount Sinai. You got this lunatic Moses who claimed the bush spoke to him, but he got you out of slavery, so cool, we'll follow him for a little while. Right? You got this lunatic Moses who's speaking to the heavens, and the heavens answer back with thunder and lightning and earthquake. And then that all pauses, and Moses responds, and then there's more thunder and lightning and earthquake, and then Moses answers, more thunder and lightning and earthquake. Like, what the heck is going on here? And then Moses goes up the mountain, he talks to God privately, he comes back down the mountain, and then God says, I am the Lord your God who led you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no false gods before me. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Keep holy the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. He lists the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you ever noticed this before. It was eye-opening to me when I realized this. When God gave the Ten Commandments, it was not like you see it in the movies, where like Moses goes up the mountain, God has a private meeting with Moses, and Moses comes down and he reads the memo to everybody. Everybody at the base of Mount Sinai heard a voice come out of the sky. How many people were there at the base of Mount Sinai? Something like six, seven, eight million. That's a lot of people. Millions of people at one time heard an audible voice come out of the sky and list for them the Ten Commandments. And they freaked out. <laughs> they told Moses, we don't want to do this anymore. You go up that mountain and talk to God and just come down to us and tell us what he said. So if you ever wonder why God doesn't generally do that thing anymore, it's because the one time he tried it, we all freaked out and asked him, never do it again. <laughs> they all heard God. Wouldn't that be cool? If you're like sitting at Mass one day, and like the, it wouldn't be cool if the roof ripped off, roof ripped off the church because you'd have to pay to replace it, but the sky opened up and you just heard God speak. Instead, he chooses to speak through the person at the lectern who's stumbling through the reading. <laughs> right? That's the normal way that God speaks to us at Mass because we asked him not to do it the other way because it scared us. Right? So you've got millions of people who encountered this, this being. That's crazy stuff. Right? Fast forward, these people, 40 years later, they've wandered in the desert for a long time due to various reasons. They get to the edge of the promised land. Joshua leads them in. They start fighting battles, and they're winning. They're grossly outnumbered, but they're winning, and they blamed it on God. <laughs> on this being who said he'd be with them. And they start saying things like, the Lord is a warrior. <laughs> the Lord is a stronghold. The Lord is my shield. Right? This being who revealed himself way back in the Garden of Eden, and then he talks to Noah, and then he talks to Abraham, and then he talks to Moses. He's with us. And we're winning wars. Like, real stuff is happening in the world. And then they get complacent. They're like, everybody else around us has a king. We want a king too. God was supposed to be their king. They wanted a king. So God says, all right, you want a king? I'll give you a king. You're not going to like it, but I'll give you a king. Yeah, we want a king. You're not going to like it. No, we want a king. Okay, fine, you get a king. First king was a deadbeat, Saul. Second king was the rock star of the Old Testament, King David. David, the, the vast majority of the Old Testament is written about or by King David. All right, he was the guy, everybody wanted King David shoes. They all wanted King David jerseys. Every little girl wanted to marry King David, and they all had a shot because he had over a thousand wives. I know. <laughs> it's a busy guy. Right? King David decides he wants to build a temple for God because God's hanging out in a tent. Right? He's, who am I? I live in a house of cedar, but God lives in a pop-up tent. I'm going to make him a house. And God says, I like what you're saying. You're not going to do it. Your son will. But because of that, I'm going to make another covenant with you. Now we've got kings descended from the line of Abraham, just like I promised. Not me, but God. Right? So God's promises are coming true. People weren't faithful to God even then. Right? They're still following their own ways. They're not taking God seriously. They all wind up in slavery in Babylon. Right? Slavery again now. And they did some hard thinking in Babylon, and they realized, you know all those laws that God gave us, all those things God told us to do that would make us happy? We didn't really try to follow those. <laughs> what if we actually tried to do what God said we should do to be happy? What if we actually tried to follow God's laws? And then they did. Boom! Within 150 years, Jesus shows up. That's crazy. When we finally started taking God seriously, taking God at his word, it didn't take that long for him to fulfill his last promise, his last big promise, right? So then you got this guy, Jesus, walking the earth, real historical figure. He's attested to in, in the Roman historian Tacitus and lots of other folks in the ancient world, real person who walked around and claimed to be God. And then we killed him and he came back to life because you couldn't keep the guy dead because he's God. He kind of proved it. There's lots of historical evidence of the resurrection. We unfortunately don't have time to get into it today, but maybe another time. Lots of cool reasons to believe the resurrection is a real historical event. 
And then God doesn't stop there, <laughs> right? Salvation history doesn't just end with Jesus when our salvation happens, when God finally sends the Redeemer that he promised back on the day of sin entered the world, right? Then fast forward 40 more days, 50 days, right? You get to Pentecost. You got the apostles hanging out in the upper room. Jesus ascended back into heaven. They're like, what the heck should we do now? I don't know. Let's go hang out with his mom for a while till we figure it out. So they're all hanging out with Mary and they hear this sound like rushing wind, right? You're going to hear this at your, your confirmation mass. This is usually the reading at confirmation mass. Uh, you'll definitely hear it at Pentecost, right? I love the reading. Pay attention to the words in it though. It's not, they didn't hear a sound of rushing wind and see tongues of fire. That's what you're used to hearing in the, the kids Bible version, Bible story version of it. They didn't hear tongues, they didn't hear rushing wind, they didn't see tongues of fire. They heard a sound that was like a rushing wind and they saw tongues as of fire. They didn't know how to describe what they experienced. They didn't have words for it. It was like a strong driving wind, but it wasn't really wind. It was like tongues of fire, but it wasn't really fire. It wasn't really tongues either. It was just this kind of thing over top of our heads. And the sound all around us, and all of a sudden we could talk to people. We didn't even know their language. That's something that God still does today. I have a very good friend of mine, Doug, who used to work for a, a group called Catholic Heart Work Camp. Some of you might be familiar with them. They do uh, teen mission trips all around the country. So Doug's job was to go scope out the campsites or the work sites to figure out like what do you need done at your house? Are we scraping and repainting? Are we building a deck? What are we doing? And what kind of supplies do we need for that? He shows up at this house out in, I think he was in Oklahoma somewhere. He shows up at this house, the woman speaks Spanish, Doug only speaks English and very bad French from when he was in high school and he didn't apply himself well. <laughs> and he's thinking, if I don't get through to you somehow, we're not gonna be able to help you. And so he goes back to the truck and he's praying like, God, you gotta help me out, I don't know what to do here. He goes back to try to tell the woman, like maybe if I speak louder and slower, she'll understand me, because that works. Right? But then all of a sudden, it doesn't work. Then all of a sudden he notices she's understanding him. And she speaks back in Spanish and he's like, wait a minute, I think I get what you're saying. He's speaking back in English, she's speaking Spanish, all of a sudden they could communicate. Like, that doesn't happen in regular, you know, normal, normal life. Unless you ask God to help you out. Wouldn't it be awesome if he did that during your Spanish oral exam? <laughs> Doesn't usually do it that way, right? Fast forward, even outside of biblical times, God keeps working throughout history. There's all these awesome moments throughout church history where like some pope convinced Attila the Hun not to destroy Rome. Like who does that? <laughs> because he prayed and asked God for help, right? Lots of cool stuff happened. The beginning of the scientific revolution was all priests. Yeah, you heard me correctly. The founding fathers of most modern sciences were Catholic priests. That's crazy. And there were a bunch of nuns in there as well. Right? So all these cool things happen throughout uh, salvation history. Salvation history, generally speaking, refers to the Bible, but it is not an, a closed book. The last book in the Bible that advances the overall story plotline, the book of Acts, is an unfinished book. You get to the end of Acts, Paul is imprisoned in Rome, he starts preaching to somebody, and then the book just ends. It doesn't even tell us how Paul dies. The book just stops. It's because the story doesn't end there. It's supposed to go on to your life and to mine. History doesn't really ever repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. All right? God is an artist. God is a poet. And God writes stories with history. Right? You could say history is his story. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. So you're meant to feel all those, those, those stories in salvation history. You're supposed to see those happening in your own life. So my question to you here at the end of this talk and as you, you move into your small groups is to think back on that plot line and figure out like where, where am I in that story right now? Or where, what parts of that story resonate most with me? Maybe you're feeling like you're, you're back in the Garden of Eden and you just screwed up royally. <laughs> And you just can't help yourself. You just mess up all the time, right? Uh, maybe you feel like you're, you're in the time of Noah and you're like, you're the only righteous person left on earth, or at least in this room. <laughs> maybe you feel like you're the only righteous person in your school. Or you're the only person who's really trying to follow God in a crazy culture that's not supportive of it. Or maybe you're one of seven. I don't know, right? Moses was, or uh, Noah was one of eight. Maybe you're Abraham and you're like, God, you're making these promises to me. I've heard them. I, 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 I hear about this stuff at Upper Room. I don't see it happening in my life. Where the heck are you? <laughs> like, nice promises, but let's see some action. Maybe that's where you feel like you are. Maybe you're like, I don't know, King David, where everything seems like it's going great until David had a porn problem. True story. David's big downfall is he went and married somebody else's wife. Well, he slept with her first, got her pregnant, killed her husband, and then married her. Right? But he went out on the roof of his house when he knew women were going to be bathing on the roof. He put himself in a position where he was going to be experiencing bad stuff. Maybe you're like, you're like David, like everybody else sees my rock star veneer, but on the inside, I'm a train wreck, man. 
Or maybe you're, you're in the part of the story where you're just hanging out with Jesus, like word incarnate, God is here. You're like hanging out at one of those campfires with Jesus late at night with the apostles, and you're like, life is good. <laughs> Can we just stay here for a while? Or maybe you're an ax, and you're like, I, don't, like I, I feel God's moving in my life. I don't have words for it. I don't know what to say about it. My friends will think I'm nuts if I bring this up. Like, God is doing stuff, and I don't know what to say. Or maybe you're somewhere else along the plot line there. All right? Every one of us is somewhere in that story because God does exist. And he does work in the world. And he's incredibly patient, even when we're snotty little brats to him. <laughs> we all are. I am as well. I'm the first person in line at confession once a month because I'm a snotty little brat to God. <laughs> I'm ungrateful. <laughs> I don't respect him as God all the time like I should. I'm not saying this to brag. This is, I'm embarrassed by that. But this is what I confess all the time. <laughs> right? I am that snotty little brat in the Garden of Eden that thinks I know better than God. I am that snotty little brat who got on the boat with somebody else's righteousness, not my own. <laughs> I am that snotty little brat who's questioning God all the time, saying, your promises don't mean anything to me if you don't actually do something right now. And maybe that's you too, I don't know. So I hope you got something out of this. I hope you figured out that God is real and God is working in history somewhere. Uh, and maybe you figured out what part of that story resonates most with your life. Thank you for your time and attention.